Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. There you go. It really means uh, well, it means a lot to see you guys here. I know that you're really bummed to be missing the uh, State of the Union address, so <laughs> so thankful. It's kind of boomy, Mike. It's kind of boomy. I don't know what's going on. All right, so we are in uh, chapter 13, and uh, I'm going to open our time in prayer, and then uh, we'll have fun debating the beast. Listen to some Iron Maiden before to get me ready. If you don't know what that is, you can Google that later. So let me pray. Father, um, your word says that if anybody's lacking wisdom, that we should ask you and that you will supply it. And then it's our job to trust the wisdom that you give to us. And in your word this evening, we are reminded that, that understanding your word requires wisdom. And so as we try to navigate some complex issues, uh, I just ask that you, by your spirit, would give us wisdom to understand what you are saying to the church, to see what you are communicating, and, and you call us to perseverance and faithfulness. So I pray that that would be the fruit of your word of this text, that we would have a wisdom that manifests itself through faithfulness and perseverance. And Lord, as we uh, are looking at kingdoms and rulers and, and peoples being um, crushed, we are thinking uh, especially of our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine as we hear stories and see pictures of of churches and Christians gathered while missiles are flying. Father, we pray that you would be with them, that you would give them wisdom, that they would persevere. And we pray that you would protect them and protect the people uh, of Ukraine. And Father, we ask for you either to uh, regenerate and save Putin and change uh, his life or that you would uh, crush him. And we trust you and your wisdom to do what is right and just. And so we bring all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we go. Revelation 13. It's the beast. So here we go. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a review, but it's going to be short review. We're not going to go all the way back to uh, Revelation 1. I'm figuring out how to do this, okay? So um, just last week, a quick review. We got um, what I would say, we tried to describe as a peek behind the curtain uh, as John is looking at events that took place in history. They're not future events. Uh, they weren't even present events. They were events uh, in his past, but he was seeing them from heaven uh, rather than from earth. So he's not seeing different events. He's just seeing these events from a different perspective. The veil is being uh, pulled back and he's seeing uh, what's going on behind the scenes. There were three uh, figures that uh, play a prominent role in Revelation 12. They are uh, the great dragon, there is the woman, and there is um, the child. And so we saw that the dragon uh, sought to destroy uh, the infant Jesus, uh, but he failed miserably. And then he sought to destroy the woman. We argue that that is the uh, faithful Jewish remnant that was uh, waiting the arrival of the promised Messiah. And again, he failed at that. And after that, the dragon uh, essentially is declaring war on those who hold to the word of God. The dragon is going to now uh, declare war on the church. And Revelation 12 ended with this ominous scene of this dragon standing on the sand of the sea as if prepared to call these monsters out of the sea and to go and attack and declare war uh, on the church. So that is, uh, th that is in a very small, in a nutshell, what happened in uh, chapter 12. Uh, we had a description of the dragon. It's an interesting dragon. He has seven heads. There's seven diadems, presumably one for each of the heads. And of course, there were 10 horns that were mentioned. And what we talked about is that the dragon that shows up in Revelation 12 
is, is collectively representative of the beast that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7. So in, the, in Daniel chapter 7, he saw uh, four different beasts. Those four beasts combined had seven heads. There were seven diadems. There were 10 horns. And we looked at how each one of those beasts represents um, a particular nation uh, that was going to rule and crush uh, the earth. And in order, those were uh, Babylon. That would have been the kingdom that uh, Daniel lived in. And then it was, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Persia with the Medes and Greece. And then finally, it was Rome. And so one of the things that I was trying to suggest is that there's, there's three important things we have to acknowledge about the dragon and the presence of the dragon in Revelation 12. First of all, that as we're thinking about world history and particularly the kingdoms and nations that were mentioned uh, in Daniel, that there is a, we are to understand there is a dragon behind those nations. There are demonic realities. Uh, I think Rustin said, we don't, we don't fight against flesh and blood, uh, but there are flesh and blood manifestations of dark spiritual forces. And so there are dragon-like forces, demonic things behind uh, nations and kingdoms and kings. Um, the dragon power, uh, there was dragon power behind the attempts to kill Jesus uh, when he was a child. That, that order came from the hand of, of Herod, but there was a dragon behind that. There was a, a dragon power behind uh, the attempts to crush uh, the faithful Jews, the remnant of the Jews. And so we understand there are these demonic powers behind uh, earthly powers. And also, we need to consider um, what's happening, what John is seeing unfold in terms of his immediate future. Uh, we need to do that in light of Daniel's visions, because John is constantly employing Daniel images, Daniel languages. And it's as if John is saying, you need to put on some Daniel glasses and read Revelation, and then you will start to see the things that John is trying to point out to us. Uh, John is talking about things that are going to happen, and you'll see that as we get into chapter 13, uh, in the immediate future of his audience. So John is writing to seven churches in Asia that existed at the time that John wrote it, and he's talking to them about things that they are going to experience. So we need to think about the immediate context, that being uh, 60 to 70 AD or so, and understand that that's, that's who he initially is writing to. Okay, so with that in mind, we're gonna dive into Revelation 13, and we can break it into two parts, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read the whole thing at once because I think it will be helpful to like make connections uh, when we're observing particular things. So I'm going to read the whole thing, Revelation 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority." One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to other blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear." If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. 
It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs... And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. All right, you guys ready? This is the chapter because we've got dragons and we have beasts and we've got Ozzy Osbourne's favorite number, 666. So what I want to do is before we dive into the details of trying to figure out all the specifics is to step back a little bit and try and look at the big picture. Um, that's not to imply that the details here do not matter. They do matter. But rather, it means that we need to consider the forest before we consider the trees, because the forest will tell us what kind of trees uh, we are looking at. Or uh, think of it this way, if you want to accurately um, see the forest, right, you want to see what's going on, you have to understand the context, the large context of what's happening in Revelation, and specifically what's happening in Revelation chapter 13. So what that means is that we don't want to start tonight by going, who is the beast? And what does 666 mean? Now, we will get there at the end, Lord willing, but that's not where we want to start. We want to start by asking, what, what is the, the general shape or the rhythm of this chapter? What is the general shape or the rhythm of the book of Revelation? All right, so I want to suggest to you that what we're seeing in Revelation, and specifically you'll see it in the text this evening, is that we are reading uh, or seeing what could be described as an inverted creation story, right? An inverted creation story. How many of you guys are fans of Stranger Things? Anybody? Okay. You know the upside down? The upside down is this world, but the opposite, right? It's like a negative of that. It's actually a really brilliant way of thinking about um, um, spheres and realms and dimensions. Um, so you need to think about what we're reading in here is very much creation language, but it's inverted creation language. Like Revelation 13, the very beginning of Genesis starts with the spirit of God over where? Water. The water. Where is the dragon? It's by the water, Okay. It's from the water in Genesis, from that point moving forward, that God creates all things. God creates everything. The climax of his creation is Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are given dominion over the beast. That's their job. They are to rule over the beast. When Adam and Eve exert dominion over the animals and over the beast, there is peace and there is order and there is life. That's what Eden is supposed to look like. In Genesis 3, the order is inverted. The beast rules over the man. The serpent rules the man. What happens? Death, sin, separation, confusion, Chaos. When you invert the creation story, you go from peace to chaos, from life to death, from peace to war. Okay, so God has intended uh, his image bearer, Adam, to rule over the beast 
and over the earth, and in doing so, there will be peace and order. As we go forward in the redemptive story, uh, God gives authority to his image, Adam to rule, but God's image also shows up later in Christ, and God gives his image, uh, gives his image um, authority to rule over all things. It is the image of, of God, Jesus, the image of the invisible God, who performs signs and wonders and miracles that vindicate and authenticate his claim to be Christ, the promised Messiah. They vindicate his claim to be Lord. This is even especially manifested in his death and resurrection, okay? Those are signs that vindicate that he is this world's uh, one and only true Lord, it is God through his image bearer, Jesus, who breathes a new spirit life into his people, empowering them to live for him. It is God uh, through his image bearer, Christ, who is building a kingdom that consists of people from every nation, tribe, and language, under, uh, people all over uh, the earth. It is the church that Jesus exhorts earlier in Revelation to conquer. And if they conquer, there will be a reward that is given to them. It is the faithful remnant of the 144,000 Jews who are pulled out and marked uh, from the 12 tribes in Revelation chapter 7. They have been marked and they have received a seal and that seal protects them from the judgment that is to come. All of those things are true, but hopefully as I was describing those things, you heard a lot of things that Revelation 13 said, because all of those things are also, also happening in Revelation 13, but they are inverted. In Revelation 13, it is not God who is doing all of these things. It is the dragon and the beast that is doing these things. It is not man who is ruling the beast, but it is the beast who is ruling the man. Everything that the beasts do, and by the way, there are two beasts mentioned, and they are not the same beast. Everything that they do is a counterfeit to what God has already done, right? And it'll be important to understand that counterfeit later uh, in the text, because it will help control the way we understand particular things, okay? So everything the beast does is a counterfeit to what God has already done or to what God has already said. So the specific identities about the beast, uh, both of them, those things do matter, but in a sense, they are, they are secondary to understanding that everything that is unfolding is a, it's a counterfeit God with a counterfeit gospel and a counterfeit work all of it from beginning to the end. You have to start with that before you get to the specific details. Um, this means that the beast and God are mutually exclusive. The beast and God are mutually exclusive. There can be no synthesis between beastly things and God things. There can be no third way option. The beast are antithetical to our Christian faith. The work of the beast and the teachings of the beast are antithetical to our Christian faith and our ethic. That is to say that the beast and Christ and his church are diametrically opposed, and that's why there is war, okay? That's why we have this conflict. So we have to start with that understanding, and then we can dive into the other questions. And so we will dive into the other questions. We'll look first at the first beast that's mentioned. In, in verse 1, John says, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And, I, and the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Okay? So, First of all, we want to just acknowledge that the beast that John is describing in, in Revelation 13 is very similar, but not identical to the dragon that is described in Revelation 12. They are very similar, but they are not 
identical. Uh, the dragon in Revelation 12 has seven heads with seven diadems, and the beast in Revelation 13 has not seven diadems, but ten of them, and it's one for each of the horns. Now, I've been arguing that whenever we're, we're looking at beast and heads and diadems and all that stuff, we have to let Daniel inform the way that we understand and interpret that. And in Daniel 7, uh, and we'll read that in just a moment, Daniel saw uh, four separate beasts, four different beasts. Last week, we noted that collectively that they had seven heads and they had seven diadems and that there were 10 horns. Again, similarity with what John is seeing, but there's not they're not necessarily um, exactly the same. So I want to read from you Daniel chapter 7, verses 3 through 8. That's the vision of the beast because it's going to help us understand some of what John's saying here. It says, And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth because, or between its teeth and it was told, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and, had, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn. A little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in his, or, his horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel was terrified, no wonder, right? If this showed up in your dream, you'd be freaked out too. So the first beast that Daniel saw was like a lion, okay? And this should sound very familiar with Revelation 13. Like a lion, the second was like a bear. The third beast was like a leopard. But the, four beast, the fourth beast isn't likened to any of those things. It is unique and it is different from the previous three beasts. This beast is unique in that it has the 10 horns. It's unique because it crushes the earth. It speaks great things, okay? Now, Compare that with what John, how John describes the first beast in Revelation 13. It's like a leopard, it's, it's like a bear, and it's like a lion, and it speaks blasphemous things, okay? This is not the first beast, and it's not the second beast, and it's not the third beast. That's not what John is seeing. It's like those things. We know from Daniel but the first beast that Daniel saw, do you guys remember what it was? What's the first beast? Anybody remember? Anybody not named Rustin? What was the first beast? What did it represent? Babylon. Babylon. And, it, and it specifically is a description of Nebuchadnezzar, okay? You remember Nebuchadnezzar looked out his, 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 uh, his kingdom, this is so great, all the things that I have done, right? What did God do to Nebuchadnezzar? humbled him, right? And literally put him down. In Daniel 4, it says, immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. So Nebuchadnezzar becomes beastly and he's got like these feather things and he's got these his like nails, like haven't been cut for a long time. So he's like a claw, okay? The first beast that, this is, this is amazing. The first beast that Daniel describes was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And then I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it. That's Nebuchadnezzar. He was plucked up from the ground. The eagle's wings were gone. He was made to stand up like a man and the mind of a man was given back to Nebuchadnezzar. That's Babylon. The first beast is Babylon. 
The second and third beast represent Persia and Greece. And in history, those kingdoms like Babylon had already come and had gone. What Daniel's dream is left with is a fourth beast. One, two, and three have already showed up. They've passed. We are waiting for this fourth beast to come. And we know from Daniel, the fourth beast is like a culmination of the previous three. And yet the fourth beast is even worse than the first three to come. So what John is seeing in Revelation 13 is Daniel's fourth beast, right? That's all that to say. What John is seeing is Daniel's fourth beast. And it's as if John is saying, brace yourself because this is the fourth beast that Daniel spoke of. It's here. We've been waiting. God said it's going to happen. Daniel saw it. And now it is going to happen. The natural question is what king or what nation or what kingdom does that fourth beast represent? And the answer to that would be Rome. The fourth beast of Daniel's vision is Rome. Now, last week, if you remember, it was last week. Yes, last week, um, Walt made a comment, uh, I think it was towards the end of the class, and he was saying that John was in trouble with Rome right? And he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And the reason he got in trouble was for his testimony to the word of Christ. He has been put away because he's preaching the gospel, okay? Now, John is writing a letter from basically prison, right, exile, on an, on an island. How does that letter get to the churches in Asia? You think about this? How's it going to get there? How's it going to be distributed, though? At some point, this letter is going to be the hands of a Roman official, most likely. Which means John is going to be writing something that needs to be clear enough for the church to understand, but not so clear that he's necessarily going to get busted if it gets into the wrong hands, right? Right? So there's a little bit of John saying things without necessarily saying them. Why doesn't John just say, it's Rome, guys? Well, he's already in trouble, right? What's going to happen to the churches that get the letter? Yeah, they won't get the letter, right? They're not going to get the letter. So I think that um, throughout Revelation, we clearly have that kind of talk going on. But I think specifically, as John is talking about the beast, he's, he's telling us it's Rome without coming out and saying it's Rome. One commentator put it this way. If I wanted to tell you that I'm thinking, uh, if I wanted to communicate Chicago to you, but I couldn't say Chicago because it would cause whatever, Okay. How could I get you to think of Chicago without saying the word Chicago? What would I say? What would I say? If I said the Windy City, everybody would know. Oh, yeah, you're talking about Chicago, right? Or if I said the city that never sleeps, you'd know I was talking about New York. New York. Oh, or if I refer to the Emerald City, you would know I was referring to what? Yeah. Old Seattle. Old Seattle, yeah. <laughs> Old Seattle. So John is talking about a beast and there's seven heads. Seven is a, a number that, that figures prominently. What city in John's time is associated with the number seven? Now, you maybe don't know this off the top of your head, but if you go home or if you want to do it right now, I'll give you a, a, a special dispensation to pull your smartphone out and look at the, the city of seven hills. And what Google will come up first is, guess what? It's Rome. Now, we don't need Google to figure that out for us because John figured it out for us. And he actually tells us, he actually interprets what these seven, uh, these seven heads mean for us. It comes uh, in Revelation 17. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads, okay, John, in Revelation 13, the seven heads are what? They're seven mountains on which the woman is seated. We're not to the woman yet. We'll get to that later. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also 
seven kings, okay? So this, these seven heads represent two different things at the same time. They represent seven hills, right? Or the, the seven heads are seven mountains, and they also represent seven rulers or seven kings. Now, John tells us of the seven kings represented here, five of them have fallen. That means five of them are gone. There's one that is, and there's another one that's going to come, but he's going to only come for a short moment. So in history, what king are we living under when John's writing this? Which one? Six, right? Five were, they're gone. One is, that's the sixth. The seventh one is going to uh, rule separately. So seven mountains also represent seven rulers and seven kings. The ten horns, uh, then the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. So the ten horns that John saw in, in Revelation 13 represent ten other kings. They're not kings that are in power right now. They will give, be given power later. And I would argue that the seven kings that John sees are not kings in the same sense that the ten are. I think the 10 are more like governors of a particular region. The seven are, are rulers or, uh, well, you're going to see they're emperors, okay? So five have already died. One is currently ruling. The one to come after him is going to be very short-lived. And John also tells us that this sixth ruler, right, the sixth ruler that he's talking about is going to uh, execute a horrific attack on the church, and it is going to last for 42 months, which is also three and a half years. So here's, here's the, the general thing that John is saying. This beast is coming out of the sea. That is, this beast is coming out of the nations. And that beast, generally speaking, is Rome, but more specifically, that beast is, is the sixth ruler. The sixth ruler is the beast, the, the ruler who will, who will attack the church for 42 months. So here's the simple math you have to do. The first emperor who took Rome from a republic to an empire, his name was, I'm thinking that you probably know, Coleman, the first emperor of Rome. Oh, you know it. You just not, it's Julius Caesar, uh, Julius took it from... He was a dictator. Right. He wasn't an emperor. Correct. Correct. You, technically, you're right. But it's under his rule that they went from a republic to being a dictator. Yeah. Okay? So he's the first. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligua. Who's next? Claudius. Who's number six? Nero. Nero, who rules from 54 to 68 AD. After Nero comes Galba, who rules for a very short time, that being a year. We do know from history that Nero um, was responsible for the first uh, Christian persecution and that severe attack on the church. Anybody want to guess how long it lasted? 42 months. 42 months. Um, there was a great fire in Rome Nero probably started that fire, was responsible for it, and he blamed the Christians for it. Tacitus, the Roman historian, he said this, therefore, to stop the rumor, the rumor that Nero was actually responsible for this fire, he falsely charged with guilt and punished with most fearful tortures the persons commonly called Christians who were hated for their, their enormities. Christus, that's, they're talking about Christ, the founder of that name was put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition repressed for a time broke out yet again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also, whither all things horrible and disgraceful flow from all quarters as to a common receptacle and where they are encouraged." 
Accordingly, first, those were arrested who confessed they were Christians. Next, on their information, a vast multitude were convicted, not so much of the charge of burning the city as of hating the human race. So Nero blames the Christians. He tortures them. He gets them to falsely admit things. They give up names. Those family get interrogated. They get put in prison. And then Fox's Book of Martyrs, Martyrs, that's a very different book. Fox's Book of Martyrs, he records this. This was the occasion of the first persecution. He's talking about the fire in Rome. And the barbarities exercised on the Christians were such as even excited the commiseration of the Romans themselves. Nero even refined upon cruelty and contrived all manner of punishments for the Christians that the most infernal imagination could design. In particular, he had some sewed up in skins of wild beasts and then worried by dogs until they expired, and others dressed in shirts made stiff with wax, fixed to axle trees, and set on fire in his gardens in order to illuminate them. This persecution was general throughout the whole Roman Empire, but it rather increased than diminished the spirit of Christianity." So there's, there's tons more you can read about what Nero and then Domitian uh, did to the Christians. But the first persecution to break out against the church in Rome came at the hand of Nero. He is the sixth emperor, and it lasted for 42 months. And in that, um, he did, did t- horrific things things. They, they, Fox's Book of Mar, I don't know if you're connecting the dots, they would take animal skins and wrap Christians in them and then set wild beasts on these, these Christians who were wearing skins. So they look like animals. So they're essentially running for their lives until they cannot run anymore. And these wild beasts are literally eating these Christians alive. Christians were quartered, Right? horses tied to, to each limb and just continue to pull and to pull and to pull until things start giving away. Being lit on fire while you're alive in a garden for sport. This is, this is beastly activity. This is what Nero was doing. So if we look at the big picture, the seven rulers, the, the seven hills, the seven mountains, the sixth ruler, Uh, launching an attack on the church, that attack lasting uh, for 42 months. It seems to be like all these pieces fit together. The beast is Rome, uh, generally speaking, and and most most specifically speaking, the beast um, is Nero. Now, I want you to notice what John says in verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, And they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? Okay, now here's the question. Did they worship the dragon, who is Satan, or did they worship the beast, the empire, and the emperor? The the answer is yes. John is, is, the veil is being pulled back. This loyalty to Rome And the emperor's was dragon worship. Now, do you think if you had pulled these Roman citizens aside and said, do you think you worship Satan? What would they have said? No. What's John saying? Yes. Yes, they do. To worship the beast, that is Rome and Nero, is to worship the dragon. And Revelation You cannot separate the two. To worship one is to worship the other. Now, this sets us up for the second beast who we are introduced to in verse 11. John says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. I want you to pay very attention, close attention to the words, okay? Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Okay, what is the very, very first thing John tells us about the second beast? What is it? It rises out of the earth. 
The first beast we're introduced to rises out of the sea. The second beast we're introduced to rises out of the earth. Do you guys remember why that would be important? What is, do you guys remember the Greek word for, for earth, the word that gets translated? Anybody not named Rustin remember the Greek word? <laughs> do you remember what it is? It's, it's, it's gehe or gay. And that word gets in John's gospel, it doesn't mean the whole earth. It typically means the land. The first beast is a sea beast. The sea is where the Gentiles come from. The second beast is a gay, gehe, earth, land beast. The land is what? Is Jerusalem. Okay? This beast is different. It's not coming from the Gentile nations. It's coming from the land. Second of all, John's description of what this beast looks like initially is not very beastly. I don't know anybody who's ever dressed up as a lamb to scare somebody for Halloween, right? But this beast looks like a lamb. That, that single word to a Jew, the land and a lamb, what would that mean? Okay, like a priesthood or something, right? Okay, so just keep going with us, okay? First beast from the sea, second beast is from, uh, from the land, from Jerusalem. It looks like a lamb, but it talks not like a lamb, nor does it talk like a man. It talks like what? A dragon. This is a deceptive lamb. This is a lamb that speaks blasphemy, okay? Uh, we know from Revelation 16 and 19 that the land beast is a false prophet. John is going to interpret the sign, right? He tells us what the, the seven heads are. Those are seven mountains. Those are seven kings. Also, he's going to tell us who this land beast is. And the land beast is a false prophet. And this false prophet land beast works in concert, if you will, with the first beast. And you'll notice that the second beast does things that ought to be very familiar, okay? Uh, one of the things it does is this land beast calls fire down from heaven. Who else calls fire down from heaven? Prophets call fire down from heaven. You know the story of Elijah when he goes to battle with the, the false prophets of Baal? calls fire down. They're going to, hey, you call your gods and see if fire will come down and light this, this pile of wood. And, and he taunts their false gods. Like, maybe he's on the toilet, right? Maybe you need to talk a little louder. The prophets call down fire from heaven. There's also signs and wonders that are done. These are echoes, not just of Old Testament prophets, but also of Moses himself. And think about Moses, right? is not only performing signs when he's before Pharaoh, but Moses is entrusted with the establishment and the building of something. What does Moses build? A tabernacle, right? He builds a dwelling place for God. And in the same way, this false prophet, this land beast, is, is going to have, if you will, a place, right? It's referred to as an image in, in verses 14 through 15. And by the signs that it is allowed to work and the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, again, on the land, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Okay, again, we're, we want to look through the lens of Daniel. These things have happened before. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, he builds something and people have to bow down to it. And if they don't bow down to it, what happens? Fiery furnace, right? You're done. It's over. What did Nebuchadnezzar build? This is a little bit of a trick question. He built an image. It does not say an image of himself. It just says 
he built an image. We know in Daniel that it was nine feet wide and it was 90 feet tall. Now, building images like that was not unique. That was actually fairly, uh, a fairly normal practice. Uh, it's called an obelisk, and they are fairly prevalent. Uh, one guy was arguing that to, to worship this, this image that Nebuchadnezzar had made was essentially a pledge of loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar and to Babylon and to uh, the gods that Nebuchadnezzar uh, preferred and trusted in, okay? Now, in the story of, in, in the book of Daniel, everybody's ordered to worship the image. And we've got three guys who are like, no, we're not gonna do it, right? Shadrach and Abednego, they're not gonna do it. There are three faithful Jewish men who refuse to bow in worship. They get thrown into the fire. There's a, I, I think, a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ who is with them. They are spared. In the end, Nebuchadnezzar uh, gets converted. But you want that story always running in the background as we're reading Revelation. Because what John is probably talking about here, again, is an inversion of that story. It's like it's happening again. But instead of Israelites refusing to bow down to, to pledge loyalty to this king and to this kingdom and to his gods, they are now not only active participants, but now there are people who have become evangelists for this king and for this kingdom and for uh, those false gods. They become evangelists for this beastly kingdom. So I think what John is, is, has in mind here is both a general group, and then there's probably uh, somebody specific he has in mind as well, but I think he has in mind essentially um, apostate Jews, Jews who have walked away uh, from their faith, who have uh, essentially apostatized and are in cahoots with Rome. And in a moment, you'll, we'll, we'll look back and we know that this actually happened. This actually happened quite a bit, okay? It's from the image, this structure thing, that people can be ordered to be killed, right? So this is a serious matter. Somehow, this false prophet, from this image, it, people are being ordered to kill. And remember, this image speaks, okay? So what type of structure speaks in the land? I know it sounds weird, but just think, a, a structure that speaks, a structure that says something, a structure that instructs in the land, in Jerusalem, what is it? It's the temple, right? The temple is, is the place that Speaks. So I think John here, in referring to the second beast, the land beast, is probably talking about uh, the priesthood. It would also involve the temple. And he's implying, he's revealing that the temple had become um, demonic in nature. Now that sounds, maybe that sounds harsh, but I want you to think, I want you to think through this. The point of the temple from the beginning was what? It was a place to gather. It was a place to worship, but the temple was telling a story. The temple was always pointing towards Christ. He is the real temple. God's dwelling with us. The purpose of the temple was always to prepare and to point to Christ. That was its purpose. When Christ comes... The temple is no longer necessary. Do you follow me so far? The temple was to point to Christ. Christ comes. Guess what? We don't need the pointer anymore. But here's the thing. When you reject Christ to the temple always pointed to, and you cling to the temple, what have you just made the temple? You've made it a lie. You've made it an idol. It's become godless. 
because you haven't actually listened to what the temple was saying. You've actually rejected what that temple was always about. And now, if you're going to maintain this temple, the temple, you must make it a lie. You must make it something it never was. You have to reject what the temple was always preaching and somehow embrace the temple, right? It becomes demonic. Jesus talks about Jews in in Revelation who are not really Jews. He talks about the synagogue as a synagogue of what? Okay, as a synagogue of Satan. One of the accusations that was made against Paul and the early church was that there, was, there were two main things. One, well, three. One was they teach against the law of Moses. The second was they desecrate the temple. And the third one is they claim there was another king other than Caesar. You desecrate the temple, Christians, and you claim that there is another king than Caesar. Remember what the Jews shouted when Pilate offered to release Jesus to them. Their, their, their shout was, we have no king but Caesar. I think this is, this is what John is talking about. The priesthood has abandoned the truth. They have abandoned um, God. They had abandoned and rejected Christ. And what they were left with was a, a godless system because they refused to acknowledge what it was always pointing to. Now, this, if you're following me, this leaves us now with a mark, because we've got a temple, we've got priests, we've got false prophets, but you notice there's a mark that was given, okay? And remember, counterfeit. Always think counterfeit. Being marked on the head and the forehead, or the, on the hand and the forehead, was not new. This is not a new thing, This is something that has been true of God's people for a long, long time. Back in Exodus, after the Passover, 13, Exodus 13, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial on between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord uh, brought you out of Egypt. What was that seal on the forehead and the hand about? It was about Passover, It was about God hearing the cries of his people. It was about God being the rescuer of his people. They belonged to him. They were marked as being his unique people. You remember, we already said that God put a seal upon the 144,000 Jews who were going to be spared from the coming judgment on Israel. God is a God who marks and seals his people. When we hear the false prophet marking and sealing people, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a physical thing going on here. It's a counterfeit, right? This is a different God. This is a different exodus. This is a different rescue. This is a different people. It is a counterfeit seal. It's the beast version, counterfeit version of what God has already done. Okay? And if that's what John has in his mind, God seals his people, they belong to him, and also the people of the beast, they, ha- they are sealed and set apart as well, then that is going to um, change the way we think about the buying and the selling. Okay? Because John clearly says that one of the things that the second beast does, uh, it causes all both Uh, small and great, rich and poor, and free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, you read that, and and here's what we think. You have to have a mark. Is it a microchip? Something. And if you don't have it, then when you go to the grocery store to buy whatever, you can't get it because you don't have the mark of the beast, right? That's a very common way of understanding uh, what John is saying here. But I don't think that's what John is saying at all. I think he's saying something different. If the context is the priesthood and the context is is the temple, what would the buying and the selling be? 
Yeah, Jesus actually said a lot about buying and selling at the temple, didn't he? In one of the most hot expressions of his anger, it took place where? At a temple where he says, this was supposed to be a house of prayer. You have turned it into a den of thieves. And he cracks the whip and he's kicking tables over and chucking stuff, right? He's angry. Who's he angry with? Buyers and the sellers in the temple. If, if this false prophet, if this earth beast is talking about the priesthood and the land and the temple, then it's, I think, highly likely that the buying and selling that couldn't happen was not buying and selling of, of food like you go to get groceries, but the interactions that were so common at the temple. And we know from the book of Acts, who wasn't allowed to go into the temple? Who was getting kicked out? It was the Christians who were getting, they were getting kicked out. So I think that that buying and selling probably has a temple context to it and not a, uh, a Safeway context, if you will. Okay, now the last thing, boy, we're pushing it. What is the number of the beast? What are we to make of that number? How do we go about it? Verse 18, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Just to clarify, the number is not 666. The number is 666. What are we supposed to do with this? Well, first, we're going to have to think about it, because <laughs> John says, who has wisdom and understanding, figure this thing out, okay? So you can figure it out. But John isn't, doesn't envision you figuring it out. Who does John envision figuring this out? The, the churches that he's writing the letter to. He's saying, you Christians in the, in the second half of the first century, you need to have wisdom and understanding, and you're going to figure this out. Meaning that the beast... I think it, it, it most likely is somebody who was alive in the first century, and it was somebody that everybody knew, okay? Everybody would know this name. One commentator, uh, he said this, it would be odd in the extreme if young, if young Demetrius of Ephesus stayed up uh, late one night after Revelation was read to their church, and in the morning asked his father, who is Harry Kissinger? Okay? <laughs> So you get why that's funny, right? They wouldn't know that name. They don't know that person. This is not the name of somebody that we know, not a contemporary of ours. This is a contemporary of John's immediate audience. So who is the beast? There's two options. I'm only going to go into the first option. If you want the second option, get a cup of coffee, and then we'll talk after the class because I'm going too late, okay? Um, the first option, and I think this is probably the most likely option, is that, that John is, is talking again about Nero. Um, and, and the way that the number gets us to Nero, as you understand in Greek and Hebrew and in Latin, uh, letters represented sounds, and they also represented numerical values. That's not how things work in our language. We have letters for sounds. We have numbers that represent um, quantity. But in those languages, it was the same thing. The most, the most um, prevalent example of that would be if you watch the Super Bowl. How many of you guys watch the Super Bowl? What an utter disappointment it was this year. If you watch the Super Bowl, the number of the Super Bowl is always in Roman numerals, right? They're letters that represent numbers. Nero's name, um, his name, remember in, in Hebrew, it would not have the vowels in it. So his name uh, is the sum total of 666. Nero Kaiser equals 666. So given what we know about the beast being from the sea, being Rome, John talking about the sixth of the seven, of the seven, um, and Nero being that sixth of the seven, and his name representing the sum of 666, I think that it's very, very likely that the beast is generally speaking Rome, but more specifically, John is talking about Nero. There's another theory that Peter Lightheart has. 
I would say it's typically not a good idea to argue with Peter Lightheart, but I don't agree with him on this one, but it's interesting and we can talk about it later if you want. Um, what in the world does all of this, this mean for us as we go over, as we go over time? I think the end of verse 10 is the call for us. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. The times that were coming for the church were going to be some of the worst times in history. Daniel said this fourth beast is is worse than the first three. What an encouraging thing to know, right? You just became a Christian. Oh, by the way, it's going to go really bad for you. It calls for endurance because the church is going into this time of incredible suffering and yet they, they have this anchor, right? They have this, this knowledge that this one is, is not a surprise to God. Daniel centuries ago spoke of this. And as you consider um, all of the violence and all of the injustice and all of the stuff that the church is going to go through, and we're going to see much of that uh, unfold in this chapter and the following chapters, you have to remember we're not at the end of the book yet. And where we're at is not where things are going to end. And the book of Revelation, what, whatever camp you land in and how you interpret it, okay, the main takeaway of this is that, is that the church wins. There's one, one uh, theologian said the, the point of the gospel is that Jesus wins and the point of Revelation is that the church wins. And so these moments and these seasons of in, incredible persecution and suffering are intense and they are real and they are difficult. They are under God's sovereign control and no matter how dark they get, they are never the end of the story. Because in the end, the beast gets thrown into the pit and the saints throw a party. That's the end of the story. Friends, that's the end of our story. Think about what that does to a Christian in Ukraine as they're hearing fighter jets go over, and this does not look or sound or feel like winning. But you know what? In the end, the beast is going to burn, and the church is going to celebrate. And so the call is to be wise and to endure By God's grace, we are not facing anything remotely close to what our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are dealing with. Now, that's not to minimize our suffering. But whether the suffering is great or whether it's it's not massive, but it is still very real to us, we have to know this is how the story ends. It's always going to end this way. It's only going to end this way. The beast will burn. The saints will party. And that's the hope that we cling to and it gives us power to endure whatever comes. So let me pray. And then if you want to do, you want to ask questions, we'll do that because I've already gone too late. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for um, your word. We thank you that you have uh, not only inspired the writing of the scripture spirit, you have protected your word uh, through centuries. And so we thank you for it. Again, we ask for wisdom, even as we consider these things that uh, we've seen, that we've encountered in your text tonight. Lord, give us the wisdom to understand. Give us the eyes to see. And we want to take these truths to heart. Uh, We want to understand the forces that we are up against, the forces that the church has had to deal with in history. And we want to uh, have the strength to endure faithfully to the end, knowing that, uh, Christ, you are victorious over all. And in the end, the the enemies uh, will be judged justly. And so give us uh, strength, give us perseverance, and make us a faithful people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm late. I'll be up here to ask. Actually, if you can do questions now, if you want, if you have to get your kids, go ahead and get the kids. But if you want to ask a question, I will do it. If you have kids, go get your kids. But I will do questions now. Yes? 
Yeah, so in, in uh, Revelation 13, it talks about a wound that is given, and it, at some points it sounds like it's, it's a mortal wound, like it's a, like a death and resurrection kind of thing, and then at other points it's a almost died but didn't, didn't die. So um, I, I don't think that John is talking about a, um, a real death and resurrection of whatever the, the beast thing is. Um, it seems as if, um, one, it could be counterfeit because so much of what's happening in the second half of Revelation 13 is counterfeit prophet kind of speak. Um, there's, there's speculation that, and I can't remember who it was, but there was, there was a, a tipping point for the Roman Empire where it, it looked like it was going to just fall apart into chaos and it came back roaring like a lion. And so there's some thought that maybe that's what's being referred to. It looked like it was going to cave and then it came back. I, I, that would be my best guess. Yeah. Great question. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, um, if it's Nero, it would be the first beast, yeah. So the, the question was the 666 at the end, which beast is it referring to? So there's some people that think that's referring to the land beast. Um, I think it's referring to the sea beast because everything that the land beast does flows out of the sea beast, right, in that text. So... Um, I, I, I think he's talking, about, he's talking about Nero. But the reason it would come at the end is because John is talking about this very weird uh, partnership that has taken place between a sea beast and a land beast, right? And so um, as he's kind of summing that up, because in the next chapter, I think we get into the 144,000. So as that vision is kind of summing itself up, we just have Nero is kind of the face of this sea beast and there is this weird, this weird thing going on between sea beast and land beast. Yeah. Good, good question. Other questions? Going once? Going twice? All right, cool. Thank you for being here. We'll be here next week and... Uh, yeah, you're welcome to hang out, and I think there's probably still goodies out in the foyer. And if you have questions that you want to come talk personally, or if you want to know what that other option is that Peter Lightheart threw out there, I'd be happy to try and explain it to you. <laughs>